it was a time of shimmering art, delightful architecture, a time of fantasy, whimsy, unexpected twists, when philosophers who argued the interests of man joined with despots who pursued the interest of the state. The Enlightenment, this time on the Western tradition. Last time we ended with a philosophe. Remember 18th century philosophers, many of whom were infatuated with the reforming rulers of Central and Eastern Europe. The philosophes believed that what Europe really needed were philosopher kings, enlightened despots to bring innovations in political, religious and educational practices, above all to make society more rational. And the movement that followed came to be known as the Enlightenment. Prussia's Frederick the Great was thought by Voltaire to be the nearest thing to a philosopher king in all of Europe, although the reality of Frederick's enlightened despotism was far less enlightened than the philosophers thought. And Russia's Catherine the Great was described by Diderot as having the heart of Brutus with the face of Cleopatra. Actually, she had the heart of Nero and the face of May West. But to Diderot, it seemed the perfect alliance. So the world got a splendid collection of his correspondence with Catherine the Great, who became great largely because of the publicity the philosophes gave her. And the same thing happened with Voltaire, who kept up a lively correspondence with Frederick the Great. It was a kind of a renaissance relationship between men of letters who provided adulation and publicity, and rulers who provided them with gifts and subsidies and self-respect. But behind the relationships and behind the words, the reality was quite different. Privilege was not abolished in Prussia or Russia or any of the new states. On the contrary, the rulers had to rely on the nobles ever more because the nobles were the only class that was used to command. And so the rulers wound up giving nobles more privileges. In the Prussian army, for example, only nobles could be officers, a situation that went on with very few exceptions for at least a hundred years. And serfdom was not abolished in Prussian and Russian and most Habsburg lands. The serfs were freed on royal estates but not on the nobles' estates. And so, while the philosophes talked about freedom, what the enlightened despots wanted was not freedom, but regimentation and discipline. By the time Frederick II died, 4% of the Prussian population was in the army, even though his country was at peace. 4% of the American population today would give us something like 10 million soldiers. In Russia, Catherine the Great instructed her ministers to produce a constitution, had her instructions translated and circulated all over Europe to show how enlightened her country was, but nothing ever came of it. It was all like the trip she took through her dominions to see for herself how her people lived. Everywhere she went, she found clean villages with well-built houses, fat cattle, cheerful people, but the villages were actually stage sets. They were set up before she arrived. They were taken down to be reconstructed further along her route with the same cattle and the same caste of contented peasants. The man who arranged all this was Count Potemkin, Catherine's favorite and chief minister, and the villages with which he fooled the Empress, and I suspect she wanted to be fooled, these villages were called Potemkin villages, a term for empty, misleading show, and a technique still used today. 
Catherine's constitutional reforms were also false, empty fronts. And when Catherine's philosopher friends reproached her with this, she answered, it's easy for you to talk, you write on paper, I write on human flesh. In other words, it's easy to recommend improvements when you sit in your study. It's harder to produce change in real life. But was that really the difference between her and the philosophers, or was it something else? In truth, the alliance between philosophers and enlightened despots was based on a misunderstanding. The philosophers were interested in man, his progress, his dignity. Their despotic friends were interested in the state, its interests, its power. Both believed in treating people as individuals, but for very different reasons. When the despots treated people as individuals, it wasn't because they believed in the dignity of man, but because it was to the advantage of the state. It was easier to deal with a dust heap of separate individuals than with corporations and estates and other bodies with a collective personality and collective power. So where to the philosophers the equality of the individual before the law was a principle, to the rulers it was a means to eliminate the diversity of interest groups that made governing difficult. But even with this misunderstanding, the alliance lasted because it was also based on interest. The philosophers got respect and money and favors. The despots got useful publicity agents. And the misunderstanding was founded on distance as well. When Voltaire finally went to Berlin, when Diderot travel to St. Petersburg, the reality was considerably less attractive than the dream. But as long as they stayed in Paris, it was easy to believe in the new societies and their enlightened despots. In the 18th century, Russia and even Prussia were to many people impossibly far away. Of those philosophers who actually went to see for themselves, some saw only Potemkin villages and were fooled. Some were disappointed with what they found. Others were bribed or slandered. But most of the philosophes were just men who wanted to believe in something. They were surrounded by inequity and injustice at home, and the real abuses that they saw around them made them ignore, made them forget, made them dismiss the much worse abuses that took place in these utopias far away, which they wanted to regard as the promised land. So the Enlightenment was very limited. The states of the enlightened despots were modernized. They were dragged out of the dark ages into something a little less dark. Life in the dominions of Prussia and Austria did improve in some material respects. And the state machine and the military machine became competitive with the West. But you have to put it in perspective and you have to remember that the enlightened despots were always more despotic than they were enlightened. They were also exceptional. As you can see from the example of Germany, or rather, the Germanies. At this point, the Germans were hardly a nation. They had no sense of national identity. The Holy Roman Empire in which they lived was neither holy, nor Roman, nor really an empire, just a congeries of states. Any unity the empire ever imposed was purely formal. The Germans were divided among 200 or 300 states, 
and ten times as many autonomous sovereign entities, some of them no larger than a large ranch in Texas, 80 of them less than 24 miles wide. It was the old feudal structure preserved with dukes and counts and margraves and bishops and abbots and princes, all claiming their absolute right to rule over their little bit of land every ruling family claimed absolute power. They kept their position by playing the King of France off against the Holy Roman Emperor in Vienna, and as the 18th century progressed, they fell more and more under French influence. Travel through Germany today and you'll see that every other town has its palace copied from the French and probably a romantic annex like the hamlet Marie Antoinette had built at Versailles with a dairy and a rusty cabin and a fake grotto or two. But while fashion and conspicuous consumption were copied from the West, a little else was. Nor did the conspicuous consumption of the German states mean sophistication or good manners. Here was the very antithesis of the ideal of order and refinement that lay at the base of the Enlightenment. At the court of Prussia, for example, when the footmen rattled the plates at dinner, King Frederick William, Frederick the Great's father, was quite likely to whip out his pistols and shoot at their wigs to set them on fire as a punishment. And there is a description of a dinner which the Archbishop of Mainz gave in the late 18th century to his fellow electors, the princes uh, who were symbolically the managing committee of the empire. A dinner that lasted from midday until nine in the evening and while they ate, a military band provided constant music. When they had finished eating, the electors, led by the court marshal, danced on the table until they fell under it. You might say that it wasn't really safe to dine with a German prince, and the princes who were also bishops were the worst. Partly because they liked practical jokes like water spouting from the seats or dishes or glasses with holes in them partly because they grew the best wines in Germany and drank them, of course. At every meal, the Prince Bishop of Münster used to empty in one draught a large silver church bell full of wine and he expected every one of his guests to do the same. Between meals, hunting was the rule. Almost every crowned head of the time loved these killing sprees. It was the only exercise they got, after all, apart from running after women or after boys. And furthermore, since each territory was considered by its ruler as his own private estate and hunting preserve, agriculture was nearly brought to a standstill. It isn't very surprising that quite a number of these princes were on the verge of madness, impotence, alcoholism, or over the verge. They were also great collectors, and their collecting was obsessive. The Duke of Württemberg collected 4,000 different editions of the Bible. The Duke of Brunswick collected vast numbers of harpsichords and spinets, the best of which he reserved for the use of his favorite cats. Another prince decided the time of day according to his own convenience. The clocks of the state had all to be set according to the hour which he chose for his own library. And the Duke of Merseburg spent all his income on furnishing a large room with every kind of bass viol presided over by an immense double bass which was so big it could only be played from a high stool with the aid of a bow as long as a mast. So you can see that the Enlightenment didn't reach very far and you can see why the subjects of the more backward rulers envied uh, those uh, people who lived in lands like Prussia, uh, let alone France. And you can understand also why even the very limited reforms of the enlightened despots could come 
as a relief to their subjects at a time uh, when most rulers were really drunken, incompetent tyrants. And yet these boorish clods lived in palaces, worshipped in churches, applauded in theatres that were epitomes of grace. The style of the 18th century is lighter, daintier, wittier than that of any other age. It's what we call Rococo, and it originated in France, where people were tired of the pretentious grandeur of 17th century classicism. When Louis XIV died in 1715, this ushered in a revolt that had been brewing for a long time against the stateliness and the restraints he had imposed. Imagination, grace, comfort took over, at least before the well-to-do, and they created a world on which crude life impinged as little as possible. Furniture grew softer and less massive. Dress for men and women got lighter and brighter. What people wanted now was not strength, but sensibility. Not ponderousness, but pleasure. And so, solemnity went out, elegance and fantasy came in. Probably the most interesting French patron of literature and the arts was Madame de Pompadour, who was the mistress of Louis XV. It was Pompadour who protected and helped the writers who put together the monument of 18th century thought that was the Encyclopedia. And it was Pompadour who patronized painters like Boucher, who characteristically painted her holding a book. Color, freedom, delight, enchantment are the hallmark of 18th century painting. The enchanted exuberance of Boucher, the enchanted theater of Tiepolo, the enchanted mirages of the Guardi brothers, the enchanted flippancy of Fragonard. You can see this best in the work of the most representative painter of the 18th century, Jean-Antoine Watteau, with its delicacy and charm, its superficial relations, its shimmering colors. There's nothing solid or eternal about the people and the scenes he paints. They're here to enjoy themselves in a trip, in a game, a picnic, a dance. Their relations are fragile because pleasure is fragile and transitory. And so is life. It's interesting that Watteau's best-known painting, The Embarkation, takes a traditional theme, which is a pilgrimage, and transposes it to a frivolous level. The pilgrimage to Jerusalem becomes the pilgrimage to Sithra, the island of love. Here, a group of ladies and gentlemen are embarking for Sithra, and Sithra shimmers across the water like a sort of Jerusalem, just as enchanted, but profane. And the whole scene is highly theatrical, which is another characteristic of the Rococo and of 18th century society. Rococo gardens, for example, were artificial recreations of nature with artificial waterfalls, ruins, and a, a wilderness, as they called it, that made gardens into picturesque places for dreaming and rambling gardens have always tried to recreate nature, but those of the 17th century had been stately orderly creations. No shadow, no mystery, just straight beds, grand alleys, vast vistas. In the 18th century, however, you get irregularities, a whimsy, unexpected twists, 
and this was also reflected in a contemporary fad for exotic things. Turkish fashions, anything outlandish. There was more trade overseas, and the ships that went to the Near East and to China brought back a lot of things now that looked different. And since they looked different, they looked attractive. They looked vaporous. They looked frivolous. They fitted the contemporary protest against the old formality. Like gardens, Rococo fashions were as elaborate, as artificial as possible, from the wigs and bows and baskets to the completely useless little shoes. The more useless, the more anti-functional, the better. And this appreciation of the ephemeral in everything is especially evident in music. What, after all, could be more ephemeral than music? Not the notes printed on paper, but the performance, which in that time could not be captured or preserved. Music is the typical happening, and music was the model of 18th century art. It fascinated Watteau, who often painted himself as a musician. It fascinated his contemporaries. The 18th century was the great age of music, or perhaps music was the great art of the 18th century, especially elegant and witty music, as epitomized by Mozart, who died in his mid-thirties, just like Watteau. Even Rococo architecture looks musical. Rococo architects built theaters and opera houses designed so that the public could enjoy each other even more than what was going on on the stage. And opera houses went on being built in Rococo style for 200 years. And they built churches that looked like opera houses, where churches of the past were mysterious, awesome. Rococo churches are a garden of delight. There's no trace of counter-reformation hellfire, there's no trace of Puritan sobriety and restraint. Joy has replaced fear, scenery has replaced ritual, display has replaced inspiration. It's all stucco and gilt and curly cues and a lot of mirrors to reflect the light. God himself is a delight and you expect the priest to burst into an aria. Now, history doesn't pay much attention to pleasure and frivolity is not a favorite of scholars who are made of sterner stuff. But you should remember that the lighter and softer sensibility of the Rococo period also went with greater sensitivity. Sensitivity not just to our own feelings, but to the feelings of others. More and more members of the upper classes did not want their feelings bruised. And so they didn't want to see pain or suffering, which were, after all, standard aspects of contemporary life. And it was the more sensitive people of this age, like Madame de Pompadour, for example, who began to curtail torture and public execution and the repressive and cruel legislation that had survived for centuries. It was people like these who welcomed penal reform in the last third of the 18th century, or at least who welcomed campaigns for penal reform that tried to fit punishment to crime and to social utility rather than to age-old horrors like cutting off a hand for stealing a loaf of bread. Some called for reform because they were enlightened, and I shall talk about that next time. But a lot of people wanted or accepted reform simply because their taste had changed, their manners, their feelings had become more humane, they were more sensitive. And if you do good for selfish reasons, that's all right too. <laughs> 
By the 18th century, crops were larger, towns and ports were growing, the power of merchants, manufacturers, lawyers was increasing, and their success nurtured new ideas that would change the world. The Enlightenment and Society, this time on the Western tradition. It's stupid and absurd to burn people for their ideas, but it's just as stupid to believe that ideas don't matter. Uh, when you think that ideas don't matter, you can be tolerant about them, which really means that you're indifferent. Uh, the 18th century talked a lot about tolerance, just because tolerance was so rare, and it was rare because then, as today, ideas were likely to have concrete effects on the way society worked, on the way people thought, on the way they lived in society. Now today, I want to talk mostly about these ideas and their effects. And the first thing to say about them is that whilst many philosophers were nobles, 18th century ideas were dominated by the growth of the bourgeoisie in the West, its growing self-confidence and its self-assertion. Behind this advance of the bourgeoisie was an improving economy made possible by bigger and better ships, more canals for heavy transport of goods, more and better roads. You look at 16th century roads and they're largely ruts. By the 18th century, the main highways at least began to look like something we would recognize as a road. Louis XIV had started the improvements because he wanted his troops and tax collectors to get around faster. By the middle of the 18th century, France had a good system of stoned, paved roads radiating out from Paris. Spain and North Italy followed suit. The Germans and Russians tried to copy them. And by the end of the century, a Scotsman named McAdam, who had made his money in America, developed a really decent road surface. Side roads, however, remained primitive. Dust in summer, impassable mud in the winter. Land travel wasn't going to be easy for another hundred years until the railroads came along. But at least there were bridges now where only fords and ferries had been and the price of transport was falling and those who could afford it could now take coaches, a 17th century invention. And this inspired a new kind of pastime for the rich, something we call tourism. The 18th century was an age of travel books, accounts of visits to Paris, to spas to take the waters and gamble and flirt, to Italy to see the antiquities, to Venice, which was a favorite pleasure spot, and since tourists have always liked souvenirs, and since there were no cameras, the Venetians developed the first picture postcards for rich visitors, vedute, views, that you could buy and take home and hang up and talk about. The most famous Venetian painters of the 18th century, Canaletto, Bellotto, the Guardi brothers, all these had large workshops that turned out masses of pictures of San Marco and the Grand Canal and other Venetian scenes. Two of the most popular works of the 18th century were in fact going to masquerade as travel books. The first are the Persian letters of Montesquieu about the impressions of two Persian ambassadors in Paris and it suggests how curious and absurd the common places of one society appear to members of another society which has different customs and takes different things for granted. The Persian letters came out in 1721. A generation later, in 1759, Voltaire's Candide presents a more bitter satire. 
Candide is about the travels and adventures of an innocent young man, a candid young man, who has been brought up to believe that all is for the best in the best of possible worlds, and who finds that the real world is very different from what the philosophers say. Both books are very funny about very serious matters. More significantly, both are relativistic, which is the effect that travel has on thoughtful minds. And this understanding that attitudes vary with individuals and environments, as Montesquieu makes the point, this notion was an important feature of 18th century thought. And there were other signs of progress. Farming technology improved. Agriculture became more productive. Fewer crops were destroyed by armies and they were better stored. So there was more food, more people stayed alive and the population grew. Most people still lived off the land, but a healthy agriculture meant a healthy economy in general, more exchange, more buying power, more manufacturers, growing towns, growing ports, and the growing power of merchants, ship owners, financiers, and the lawyers who drew up their contracts. All this happened first in England because England was spared the worst of the wars that pumped resources out of the continental states. She also had important resources of her own. Access to cotton, lots of native wool, the water power to turn textile mills, iron and coal to feed the forges and smelt the iron. And England had Scotland, which was a backward country full of forward-looking men. MacAdam came from Scotland. So did James Watt, who gave us the steam engine. When Voltaire went to England, he marveled at what he found. Trade has made them rich. It has helped to make them free. Freedom, in turn, has spread trade further. The greatness of the state is based on this. Voltaire put the ideal clearly. Trade makes wealth. Wealth favors freedom. Freedom favors trade. Trade favors a country's greatness. That's what he wanted to see in France. That's what the bourgeois wanted to see everywhere. And those bourgeois who achieved economic power were now also going to claim political power. By the end of the century, one leader of the French Revolution made this very clear. A new distribution of wealth, he said, calls for a new distribution of power. Now, you have to be careful how you use the word bourgeois because the term covers a multitude of sins or at least a multitude of pursuits. Some bourgeois were businessmen, some were craftsmen, state employees, public servants, lawyers, financiers, manufacturers, and some were men of letter. Intellectual a term that didn't appear until the 19th century, although it was in the 18th century that writing became a profession. So there were different kinds of bourgeois, but they shared common ideas. And this common point of view, which we might call a bourgeois philosophy, didn't present itself as just bourgeois, but as a universal philosophy, something that applied to all mankind. When we talk about human rights today, we are using the language and expressing the principles of the 18th century bourgeoisie who talked about liberty and progress and man and who eventually wrote documents like this one, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, issued in France in 1789. And this was a fundamental change, which would again be stressed by American and French revolutionaries who appealed not to the special rights or characteristics of Americans or Frenchmen, 
but to the nature and the rights of man, which are universally valid. And if I keep saying man, you will understand that it is because this is what the men of this time used. This was very different from what was going to happen later in the 19th century when the proletariat, the working class, was defined as an independent entity and workers were invited to adopt a proletarian, a class doctrine that was much narrower. But in the 18th century, the bourgeoisie identified its cause with the cause of all humanity. They were bourgeois, but they considered themselves simply as human and the interests they pursued were not, as they saw it, class interests, but valid for everybody. So that today when you talk about human rights, you are expressing the principles of the 18th century bourgeoisie. This universalization of specific principles and interests was going to encourage a hypocritical pretense that what was good for the bourgeois was good for everybody. But it was also going to inspire and to justify the demand that what is done to improve the lot of the bourgeois should be done to improve the lot of everybody. And this is another principle that still affects our politics today. Another novel and important aspect of the time was that these enlightened ideas were going to be more swiftly and more widely publicized than ideas had ever been publicized before or ever could have been. This, for instance, is a French caricature of the three social orders with the commoners on top. Not that propaganda, the systematic effort to persuade, was an 18th century invention. It had always existed, but mass advocacy, at least of a secular kind, only came with the better communications and exchanges of the 18th century, with broadsheets, gazettes, newspapers, and clubs, with more books and pamphlets than ever before, with drawing rooms, cafes, debating societies, and secret societies. The most important of these secret societies were probably the Masonic lodges. They had started in 17th century England, but they were spread all over 18th century Europe by the French, who counted over 30,000 brothers. Most of the great philosophers were Masons, like Voltaire and Diderot. But also aristocrats like the king's cousin, the Duke of Orléans. And a lot of foreigners, Frederick the Great, Mozart, Washington, Franklin. As a matter of fact, if you look at the medallions on the back of our dollar bill, you'll find that one of them is a Masonic symbol. The first principle of Freemasonry was a cult of humanity. This didn't challenge the power of kings, but it did challenge the dogmas of established religion. The Mason believed in God, but not in any particular God, not in the God of any particular church or revelation, and the Mason believed in reason and in the natural religion only reason could reveal, so he wasn't impressed by religious rituals, he had his own, which we call deism. More immediately important, Masonic societies added to the number of clubs which spread the progressive ideas of Paris through the provinces which provided a sort of capillary system for the new ideas to seep into the attitudes of the upper and middle classes. And along with ideas, the vocabulary changed radically. This is the time when the word social 
turns from sociability to society and it acquires its present meaning as in sociology, as in social sciences. Now this is when words like capitalist appear, when nation and national acquire their modern sense. And this is when terms like people or populace shed their pejorative sense as in the common people, the vile populace. And they become, as the Encyclopedia of Diderot and Voltaire puts it, the most numerous and necessary part of the nation. This transformation of the, of the vocabulary is a sign that ideas are changing and changing profoundly. A few words dominate the century. Nature, happiness, virtue, reason, progress. Now, these words are not new and they do not mean the same thing for everybody, but there is nevertheless a spirit of the times, a broad agreement on certain basic notions. It was assumed that through reason and science, people could understand nature and harmonize with its laws, thus progressing towards happiness and perfection. But first they had to know about nature and the nature of nature, what nature is like. And this natural science was based on the discoveries of the 17th century, which had a far greater effect on the thought of the 18th century than on its own time. The 17th century was the great age of scientific discovery. There were the new instruments that made discovery possible, the telescope perfected by Galileo, who also invented the thermometer and greatly improved the mechanical clock. While a pupil of Galileo's, Torricelli, invented the barometer. All of these instruments permitted more exact and more extensive observations. Then there were specific discoveries. William Harvey discovered the circulation of the blood through heart and lungs. Anton Leeuwenhoek developed lenses powerful enough to see bacteria and spermatozoa. Robert Boyle worked on the behavior of gases at different temperatures and under different pressures and became the father of modern chemistry. Tremendous advances were made in mathematics by Isaac Newton and René Descartes. Advances in logarithms, differential calculus, integral calculus, all laying the groundwork of higher mathematics and the mysteries of electricity and magnetism were being revealed by William Gilbert and Benjamin Franklin by way of Italians like Alessandro Volta and Luigi Galvani. But the greatest figure in early modern science was Isaac Newton, who lived from 1643 to 1727. Newton laid the groundwork of modern physics by working out the mechanical laws of motion and especially the law of gravity, the speed with which bodies descend to Earth. And the result of this accumulation of discoveries was a radical change in the outlook of educated people. When the 17th century opened, serious scientists might still believe in witches. When the 17th century closed, this would have been impossible because no scientist believed in the supernatural forces that witches were supposed to dabble in. In Shakespeare's time, people believed that comets were portents. After Newton, they knew that Newton and Halley had calculated the movement of certain comets and that stars obey the laws of gravity just as planets did. So now human imagination accepted scientific law and began to reject magic and sorcery. 
As this book suggests, the mysteries of nature were to be unraveled by humans. In 1600, men had lived in the Middle Ages. By 1700, the mental outlook of educated people was modern. There weren't many educated people in 1700, but their number was growing along with schools and books and propaganda and debate. And as the news of scientific discoveries spread on the continent, it also affected their religious belief. You mustn't think that 17th century scientists wanted to shake anybody's religious belief. Newton himself was profoundly religious and a bit of an alchemist as well. But his discoveries took on a life of their own. After Newton, educated people knew that the solar system was kept going by its own momentum and its own laws. The Newtonian solar system rotated like clockwork according to the law of gravity. Maybe God had set the mechanism to work. Maybe God had decreed the law of gravity. But once it started, he wasn't needed anymore. And so to some, God became a figurehead, a kind of constitutional monarch. A creator indeed, but with no right to intervene in a universe that worked automatically according to the laws of physics and mechanics. You could still believe that the starry heavens proclaimed the glory of God. But the way the starry heavens worked was revealed by astronomical calculations. By the 18th century, the great discoveries of the 17th were digested and their implications drawn. Important medical advances were being made in fighting scurvy and especially smallpox. In 1783, two Frenchmen, the brothers Montgolfier, demonstrated their discovery that heated gas inside a fabric bag would cause it to rise. The Montgolfiers went to Versailles, and while the king watched, they sent up a large balloon carrying a sheep, a rooster, and a duck. A couple of months later, the first manned flight sailed over Paris, and by 1785, an American and a Frenchman had flown across the English Channel. The possibilities of science were obviously infinite, no wonder that everybody who was anybody dabbled in it. Voltaire studied mathematics and brought Newton to the general public. Another encyclopedist, d'Alembert, produced vulgarizations of science and philosophy for fashionable ladies. Diderot did chemical and anatomical experiments. And biology fascinated everybody. This is a sketch of Galvani's experiments with frog legs and electricity. So now we're in a world of science, of mechanics, a material world which it's important to exploit, to develop, in order to make people better and better off, in order to make them happy which is itself a novel notion. Aquinas hadn't talked much about happiness. Hobbes and Locke had hardly talked about happiness. But in the 18th century, people hardly ever stopped talking about happiness. This had a great deal to do with the relaxation of religious restraints, both Catholic and Protestant. And now there was talk about happiness in nature. Happiness in fresh air. This is the time when travel and sightseeing, uh, and also walking, swimming, mountain climbing, are first advocated for fun and profit. Happiness in a natural life. Noble savages are happy. Noble ladies and gentlemen try to go back to nature. 
and Marie Antoinette, the Queen of France, has a special farm built to see what natural happiness may be like. And above all, happiness in virtue and measure and reason. But there was a force even greater than natural happiness, one that was going to color the subsequent history of Europe and America as well, and that was utility, as we shall see in our next extremely useful program. There was the patron saint of nature, the prophet of utility, the champion of freedom of expression, the foe of priests and organized religion, and the quintessential 18th century thinker. Reasonable, skeptical, pragmatic. The modern philosophers, this time on the Western tradition. Last time we ended on a happy note, or rather the 18th century's notion of what made people happy. 18th century philosophers, remember, hardly ever stopped talking about happiness, and especially happiness in nature, in fresh air, in living the natural life. There was one French philosopher in particular who became the patron saint of this cult of nature, a hippie of genius named Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It was Rousseau who provided the great slogans of the French Revolution, which came 11 years after he died, the social contract, the general will, uh, men are born free, yet everywhere they are in chains. But it was also Rousseau who provided the slogans for a return to nature, for a shift from reliance on the head to reliance on the heart. Rousseau called for human beings that were genuine in a world that was genuine. Mothers suckling their own babies, parents bringing up their own children. He didn't actually follow his own advice. Every one of his five children ended up in a foundling hospital. But his influence was going to produce a radical change in taste, including a novel appreciation of natural beauty wildness, forests, landscapes. Mountains and wild places had been considered a nuisance, but towards the end of the 18th century they become visually exciting, spiritually enchanting. They become landscapes that cultivated people learn to see and enjoy so that even the author of an essay on the management of hogs can turn away from a field of turnips and expound on the beauty of a distant scene. And nature wasn't just beautiful, it was innocent. It never led you astray. As Wordsworth was going to put it, one impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil and of good than all the sages can. That's also pure Rousseau, and you can see that it doesn't appear to mesh with the rational and scientific mood of the Enlightenment. Rousseau found the dominant philosophy too crude, too rationalistic, too materialistic. His idea of happiness was dreamy, sentimental, private, where that of mainstream philosophers was public, or if you prefer social. And so we have two parallel strains of thought, with Rousseau's being a sort of counter-culture view. To the mainstream philosophers, happiness was something you had to earn, to deserve, to conquer, not just absorb. There wasn't only an individual right to happiness. There was a kind of public duty to be generous and make others happy. So private happiness was expected to coincide with public happiness and in the process it became a subject of politics. Virtue, which was seen as an important component of happiness, was now related to social harmony. 
in its old definition, which went back to the ancients, virtue meant manly strength. But the 18th century definition preferred a social model. The virtuous man was above all useful to his fellows. Virtue wasn't just private, as it might be, let's say, with a good Christian, it was public. And it had nothing to say about God, it was secularized. And as a result, morality in the 18th century moved towards reasonable, other-directed behavior. Reasonable behavior. Reason in everything. In the Enlightenment, virtue and happiness, science and nature were all related to reason. A universal reason which allowed you access to truth and to happiness. And reason was also the secret of progress. Material progress which went with intellectual progress and which brought with it moral progress. And with progress came optimism, an invention of the 18th century, and also the notion of utility, usefulness, all of which were combined and symbolized in scenes like this one. Utility has been defined by its high priest, Jeremy Bentham, as the property or tendency of something to preserve you from trouble or pain, or to procure you some good. So, for the individual, utility was whatever increased one's happiness or well-being. But for society, utility translated into the rule that the measure of whether a policy was right or wrong was whether it caused the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people. This was utilitarianism, which combined morality and self-interest into what the utilitarians called enlightened self-interest, that doing good is ultimately in your self-interest as a citizen, and that pursuing your self-interest contributes to the common wealth. The promoters of revolution in America were utilitarians, like Benjamin Franklin, and so were the founders of liberal economics, like the Scotsman Adam Smith, and you might indeed say that the typical Enlightenment thinker was a utilitarian. With reformers like Voltaire, or the Italian Beccaria, utilitarianism took the form of what Voltaire called common sense. It was in the name of common sense that they proposed reforms. End public executions, Beccaria said. End arbitrary arrest, he said. End torture. Abolish the death penalty. Make trials public. Moderate punishments and make them fit the crime. And have one law for all with no exceptions of class. Above all, let's be able to argue about these matters. Let's have freedom of thought. Let's have freedom of expression. It was on this ground that Voltaire clashed with a church which would not allow freedom of expression. And from this he concluded that the church and its priests were the greatest enemies of progress, hence of humankind. Voltaire wasn't against God, mind you. He probably agreed with a gentleman who prayed, Oh God, if there is one, save my soul if I have one. In principle, though, like most philosophers, Voltaire was a deist. He thought that there was some great power, a divine clockmaker, who wound the world up and then sat back and watched humanity make a mess of it. But Voltaire was against organized religion, which he thought was a tissue of superstition and fanaticism. And he was against priests who, he said, were engaged in fooling people and misleading them. You have to have a religion, of course, said Voltaire. You have to have a religion at least to keep your servants from stealing you blind. But you must not believe in priests. 
That was anti-clericalism, a powerful fighting creed that preached intolerance against the intolerant, but understanding and tolerance for those who did not conform to the tenets of established religion, a religion which in those days could still condemn unbelievers to a hideous death. Voltaire spent a lot of his life defending men and women who were being mistreated because of fanaticism, prejudice, injustice, like the Calas family and the Chevalier de la Barre who was tortured and executed essentially for disbelief. And as he struggled against fanaticism, Voltaire also practiced created something new which we now describe as public opinion. It was in the great political and anti-clerical campaigns of the late 18th century that public opinion became a serious factor in literate societies and the intellectual, the publicist, the man of letters was recognized as the dynamic force behind public opinion, immensely effective in spreading the message of enlightenment, which was not only rationalistic, but also utilitarian and materialistic, a belief in technical and economic progress. The greatest monument to this point of view is the encyclopedia which Voltaire and Diderot and their friends published through the 1750s and 60s. 17 volumes, three volumes of plates, all arranged in alphabetical order, which was another innovation because it abandoned traditional categories and hierarchies for a more equalitarian arrangement which put theology after production, which put princes after locksmiths because of the letter with which the word began. The encyclopedia is one long hymn to technical progress. The mechanical arts and their inventors get a degree of attention they never got before. Practical men are described as benefactors of humankind. There are endless articles on trades, on techniques like dyeing cloth, or making locks, or making stockings, on everything that's useful. Rank is subordinated to utility, Politics is subordinated to economy. Liberty in this context is essentially economic, with political liberty a kind of icing on the cake of free enterprise. And when Diderot writes the article on political man, the article is all about agriculture, demography, and wealth, because well-being, health, work, freedom, are all related. The humanism of the encyclopedists grew straight out of their materialism. They believed in evolution, in progress, in the possibility to change people, in the duty to do so, to do something for their happiness, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. To them, the universe was one great machine where everything was connected. The best and the worst aspects of this humanism can be seen in two completely different painters whom Diderot much admired. The first is Chardin, the painter of everyday life, clean, direct, intimate, deceptively simple, a sort of 18th century Vermeer. The second, however, is Greuze, melodramatic, moralistic, sententious, and generally soppy. Look at these girls so innocent that you wouldn't trust them near a hayloft. Look at the families gathered round the dying father. Greuze, like Rousseau, represented the sentimental side of enlightenment. 
Remember, though, it was the philosopher's appeal to feelings as much as to reason which launched the campaign for less terrible punishments, for a less deadly penal code, for more human treatment of our fellows. So even second-rate painting could be useful in a good cause. Utility again. Now, the true home of utility was across the channel in Britain, where there were some important differences. Where continental philosophers looked to enlightened despots and to their centralized bureaucratic states to impose necessary reforms and produce a more efficient economy, the British felt they had an efficient economy precisely because they didn't have much of a bureaucracy and because they had avoided an authoritarian state. They were protected by the ocean, they were protected by their fleet, and they kept government down to a minimum because they felt that individuals could operate more efficiently when they were left alone and not told what to do. A good expression of this is Bernard Mandeville's Fable of the Bee which he published in 1723. The fable is about a hive which functions fine until it's converted and regulated so that the bees can live a more virtuous life. And disaster strikes. The bees become sober, austere, charitable. Their productivity falls drastically. Their economy becomes a subsistence economy. No luxuries, no self-indulgence, no more time wasted buzzing around flowers, sniffing around, no more acquisitiveness, no more greed, no more surpluses. So there is no more honey, there is no more wax. It's a catastrophe. And the conclusion, individual vices are good for society. The selfishness of each conditions the prosperity of all. The ultimate version of this view can be found in Adam Smith. In his inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, published in 1776. In this, Smith argues the fundamental harmony of self-interests. He believes in free trade, competition, production, profit, above all, no regulation. The state is simply there to see that order is kept and natural laws have their free play so that you can have a peaceful contest within a peaceful context for productive activity. Now, in this sense, utilitarianism, which informed all the thought of the 18th century, was really the doctrine of a country, of a period, of a class that felt that it was on the upswing. But since the doctrine uh, took so many different shapes, it's hard to pick the quintessential 18th century utilitarian. If I had to choose, I would pick an Englishman, even though you probably don't think of him as such, a man named Benjamin Franklin. Franklin was born in Boston in 1706, the tenth son of a soap and candle maker who had 17 children in all. He began work at 12, he was trained as a printer, and he began to make money by printing paper currency for Pennsylvania and some other colonies. Like other printers, Franklin also diversified his business by bringing out a gazette and an almanac which was called Poor Richard's Almanac. Almanacs were very popular publications because you didn't really have to read well in order to consult them. You could pick up bits and pieces of information and wisdom in potted form, a bit like the Reader's Digest. And Franklin's Almanac printed a lot of proverbs and jokes, and it soon became very popular. 
Franklin then became a public figure. He promoted a fire department, he started a lending library, he promoted a school that was going to become the University of Pennsylvania, and he also became interested in science. Everybody was interested in science in those days, but Franklin was interested in useful science. He invented the Franklin stove, which he called the Pennsylvania fireplace, and which he refused to patent as a philanthropic gesture. And his stoves, which burnt the wood that was so plentiful in those days, went on warming farmhouses and frontier cabins for over two centuries. He invented bifocal spectacles, he invented the lightning rod, and when he went into public service, it was first as postmaster general of the northern colonies, a job which combined public utility and private profit very nicely. You probably know Franklin better as a diplomat in England and France, and of course as delegate to the Second Continental Congress, where he helped to draft the Declaration of Independence. But even when he was engaged in important national and international affairs, he kept working on basic things, like draining swamps, improving watering troughs for horses, curing smoky chimneys, getting streets cleaner. And when he was criticized for paying attention to such trifling matters, he answered, human felicity is produced not so much by great pieces of good fortune that seldom happen, as by little advantages that occur every day. He explained that if you teach a young man to shave himself and to keep his razor in order, you contribute more to his happiness than if you do something more grand because, I quote him, he escapes the frequent vexation of waiting for barbers, their dirty fingers, offensive breath, dull razors. He can shave when he pleases and with a good instrument. In his autobiography, Franklin insists that God helps those who help themselves. A person's fate is largely determined by his or her acts, he declares, and if you want to win, learn the rules of nature, especially human nature, a subject in which Franklin is just as realistic and pragmatic as in every other. In a way, his poor Richard's almanac serves as a guide through the hazardous territory called life. How can you depend on others when you can't depend on yourself? Why blame wolves for eating sheep when men eat a lot more than wolves do? The better you understand the world, says poor Richard, the less you like it. But Franklin didn't despise his fellow men, he just didn't exalt them. They were fallible, self-deluded, cruel, thoughtless, and yet they were capable of enlightenment, of improvement. So even though the world was a rough place where the strong ate the weak and privilege was in the saddle, the world could be made more bearable by small, gradual, remedial acts, by self-discipline, by self-confidence. As for God, said Franklin, he was best served by doing good to men. And so Franklin suggested that if you survived a shipwreck, you were better advised to build a lighthouse than a church. Above all, Benjamin Franklin was skeptical and pragmatic, never pompous, never solemn, never systematic about his philosophy. He championed a lot of useful projects, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, popular education, equality of opportunity, and fairer treatment for Indians and blacks. And there was something paradoxical about this practical man who sometimes sounded like Hobbes working so hard to improve this lousy human nature of ours. But he did it because he thought that we might still be coaxed and persuaded into courses of action that might make us, that might make our society 
a little less stupid, a little less vicious, a little more, uh, how shall I put it, a little more human. So here was the gist of 18th century thought in action. Reasonable, utilitarian, pragmatic, reformist, not revolutionist, persuaded that God helps those who help themselves. And it was going to express itself dramatically and effectively by 1776 in the American Revolution, as we shall see in our next program.